Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me today. Um, oh. If you don't know me, I'm uh, Olga Klinkova. I work uh, at uh, Moffitt uh, Cancer Center and mostly work on the uh, bone marrow transplant team. Um, all of the fellows rotate with us, so I'm excited to uh, meet all of you uh, throughout this year. Uh, so the topic of my lecture today is uh, very, very basic, uh, and uh, half of it has uh, actually nothing to do with infectious disease, but I think the knowledge of it is very important for us uh, um, uh, because uh, it helps uh, us better understand how we can help uh, our bone marrow transplant patient uh, uh, in terms of controlling their infections uh, and uh, give them uh, the best prophylaxis uh, uh, that we can. So I will start my lecture first uh, by uh, reviewing uh, this table that goes over um, indications for a transplant. So if you are interested to uh, read more about it, there is an excellent review uh, which was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in 2006, but uh, it goes over uh, principles and the basics of uh, uh, bone marrow transplant um, I would say in a very simple way. And uh, as you can see on the table, um, here are listed the indications for autologous uh, transplantation. And uh, mostly what we see and do here at Moffitt uh, would be autotransplants for the treatment of multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, some uh, um, other malignancies, uh, including some solid organ tumors, uh, specifically uh, germ cell uh, tumors. And um, uh, another type of a transplant, which is called allogenic uh, stem cell transplant, is mostly used uh, for the treatment of what we call uh, liquid hematologic malignancies, uh, such as uh, AML, ALL, uh, MDS, um, as well as lymphomas, and uh, it is also used to treat some uh, uh, non-cancer conditions uh, such as um, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, Fanconi syndrome, aplastic anemia, sickle cell anemia, even though we, we see it um, done less often because most of those uh, transplants for uh, non-cancer conditions um, uh, are done when um, you are still young, so most of it is done um, in a children children's institutions most of the times. And uh, first of all, I would like to start by uh, going over uh, two cases, uh, and then um, at the end of the lecture, we will come back to um, these two cases, and hopefully we will all have a better understanding um, what we need to do with these two patients. So the first case is uh, your patient number one on the left, who is a 62-year-old male with a diagnosis of high-risk MDS uh, transformed to acute myelogenous leukemia. He received chemotherapy in the past and currently in a um, complete remission too, which means he already required a couple of lines of therapy to get him into remission. So he's been admitted to undergo haploidentical allogenic stem cell transplant for the treatment of his MDS slash AML. So as an infectious disease consultant, you are asked uh, to see this patient and comment on antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, um, in view of anticipation of neutropenia. So remember that's case number one. The patient number two, um, is on your right. So a 62-year-old male with a diagnosis of multiple myeloma, status for chemotherapy, uh, who has been admitted to undergo autologous stem cell transplant for the treatment of multiple myeloma. And again, you are asked to comment on antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, due to anticipation of neutropenia. So these are kind of similar patients, um, because they're both being admitted to undergo a transplant. But as we learn more about them, 
they are very, very different. So what we're going to do uh, for them in terms of prophylaxis and things that we're going to watch for are very different. So we'll move to the next slide. So if uh, uh, you are a first year fellow or resident working with me, uh, a lot of times when you just start on our rotation, you might not know exactly where to start and uh, you start looking at this patient's chart and they seem to be extremely complicated. So you need to gather some basic information uh, for the start and a kind of work of that information so you can um, assess risk factors for particular infections and uh, again give uh, recommendations based on uh, the information that you gathered. So when you start evaluating the patient who is admitted for a bone marrow transplant, um, you would like to know uh, their underlying malignancy what's the conditioning regimen that is going to use in preparation for bone marrow transplant. You want to know the type of a transplant. You want to know the bone marrow source. You want to know their GVHD prophylaxis and the duration of neutropenia at the time of your evaluation. Um, so for the duration of neutropenia, again, typically um, it's a chart review and there will be some patients that are already coming in neutropenic versus some patients um, um, versus most of the patients that would become neutropenic as a result of their chemotherapy. Uh, also, when you are seeing a, um, a patient in a consult, you also want to know uh, where they're at um, in their timeline of a transplant. Are they just coming in and just getting chemotherapy started? versus they already received the transplant. And uh, for example, they're day plus seven or 10 after the transplant where their risk of infections are much higher comparing when they're just getting admitted. So when we refer to the day of the transplant, uh, what you will see a lot in the chart, we use abbreviation such as day zero, day minus one, day plus one. So when we use this um, abbreviation, transplant day zero is the actual day of your transplant. Day plus one will be day one after the transplant and day minus one or day minus two. It means that the patient is one or two days um, uh, before uh, scheduled transplant. And uh, all of this information that we're going to gather is going to um, help us determine uh, risk factors for certain infections uh, that the patient uh, potentially might get after the transplant. Um, and uh, I just included this information as well as this table um, that you can review at your spare time. But essentially, it goes over uh, the transplant parameters uh, and uh, uh, considerations for infections consequences. Uh, for example, as we know that patients that undergo an allergenic stem cell transplant are at much higher risk of infections complications of all types because of immune reconstitution that occurs much slower comparing to autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, and as I said, we will go over all of these parameters one by one um, uh, throughout the lecture. So first of all, talking about uh, the type of a transplant, um, there are two major types. Uh, the first one is uh, the autologous transplant, which means uh, that the stem cells are coming from the patient itself. Uh, versus the allergenic stem cell transplant, which means that the stem cell transplants are coming from somebody else or from the donor. Um, and uh, on the very right, you see all of these different types of allergenic stem cell transplants. And again, if you've never worked in the BMT infectious disease world, to you it might uh, look like just a bunch of letters. 
So on the next slide, I spelled uh, all of them out for you. And uh, first we will start with a matched related donor, or we call it MRD, uh, which is the most ideal transplant because it comes from a compatible sibling and is perfectly um, uh, matched um, um, source. Um, and most of these patients um, experience very uh, low rates of uh, graft versus host disease. The second type of a transplant, which we call MUD, it stands for matched and related donor, is very commonly used and uh, it is found through a national uh, bone marrow uh, database. Uh, and uh, that would be your uh, secondly, uh, second most commonly used transplant if uh, MRD is not available. Um, moving to number three, uh, the type of a transplant which we call haploidentical donor, um, which means that uh, this type of uh, a transplant comes uh, either from the parent, sibling, a child. It is a match, but it's matched only in, uh, by 50%. Um, so the problem with uh, uh, this type of a transplant is that it puts you at increased risk for GVHD. And because with this type of a transplant, um, the BMT doctor would need to use more immunosuppression. There is a post-transplant chemotherapy involved. Um, typically, these patients uh, experienced, uh, experienced prolonged duration of neutropenia comparing to above two type of transplants. The fourth type of a transplant is called MMUD or mismatched and related donor, and it's used if none of the above are available. Umbilical cord blood, or it's, it's, it's called UCB for short, um, it, we do not do them at Moffitt because um, uh, of delayed engraftment and uh, uh, very high risk of infection complications. But uh, there are still uh, centers in the United States that uh, do it quite a bit uh, due to uh, very easy access, less HLA restriction, and reduced incidence of GVHD because uh, umbilical cord uh, stem cells, they're very naive uh, um, in terms of um, their um, mismatches. And moving next. So here I listed the source uh, sources of the stem cell grafts. So your stem cells uh, could be coming, yes, from the donor, um, but um, from the donor's body, uh, they could come either from the bone marrow by uh, the procedure, uh, specifically designed to harvest it. They could come from the peripheral blood, um, and uh, this is obtained by the process of apheresis, uh, or we already mentioned the uh, cord blood unit um, as well. So the hematopoietic potency of the graft is measured by number of cells expressing CD34 antigen. So a lot of times if you uh, start reviewing a BMT primary um, uh, team's note, you, you will find this, this specific number. So that's what it, this, that's what it means. And uh, this is just a small table that uh, goes over uh, pros and cons um, uh, of um, umbilical cord blood um, versus uh, bone marrow. Um, graft sources, and uh, as I already mentioned, um, umbilical cord blood uh, unit transplant seems to be um, uh, a very promising option uh, because it's rapidly available. There is a reduced incidence of GBHD. Um, however, uh, there are definitely drawbacks of that, um, such as um, uh, patients um, uh, do experience uh, uh, delayed engraftment, and that increases uh, their risks of infections uh, actually uh, dramatically. And uh, on this slide, um, I'm going to go over your general bone marrow transplant uh, timeline. So on the left side, 
um, you see the process, the general process uh, for patients undergoing autologous VMT. So it all starts with cell mobilization when patient receives uh, GCSF or growth factor to mobilize um, his or her own stem cells. And then that follows by the harvest from the patient himself. And then uh, those cells get cryopreserved. When the time is right and the patient is ready, patient is either gets admitted or undergoes conditioning chemotherapy uh, to kill the disease uh, in the outpatient uh, clinic. That is followed by a transplant a few days later. Again, this could be done as an inpatient, but uh, believe it or not, a lot of our autologous transplants now do happen in the outpatient sector. Um, engraftment typically occurs in seven to 10 days from the type of a transplant, so from day zero. Um, and uh, once uh, engraftment occurs, uh, uh, typically a patient is able to uh, be discharged unless there are some other active uh, um, acute issues going on. So for allergenic stem cell uh, transplant, the process is outlined on your right. As you can see, um, the process starts by um, HLA matching, and uh, you want to make sure that you have the right donor for your patient. So once you identify the donor, um, the donor uh, undergoes mobilization and harvest of the cells, and uh, those cells could be cryopreserved, um, or this could be done simultaneously while the patient is undergoing conditioning chemotherapy, uh, which is typically done on the inpatient basis. So for allergenic stem cell transplant patients, at this point, they get admitted. So chemotherapy is uh, typically started a few days before the transplant. Um, then the transplant or cell infusion occurs. And uh, this is a critical time between the transplant itself or day zero up until engraftment, uh, because that's where we see most of the infectious complications uh, post-transplant. So we will touch base about it in details, but engraftment typically occurs um, within two to four weeks, depending on the type of uh, uh, a transplant patient received. And here is just a nice graph that um, kind of gives you a visual presentation uh, what, what happens uh, with our patients. So as you can see, uh, on day minus seven, patient receives uh, chemotherapy plus minus radiation in preparation for the transplant. And then on day zero, that's when the cell infusion of the donor cells or um, autologous cells occur. And uh, then from day zero to uh, on, um, we mostly focus on prophylaxis and treatment of infections, GBHD, and awaiting um, the engraftment. For the patients uh, undergoing allergenic stem cell transplants, um, another important um, um, step is initiation of immunosuppression that typically starts, as you can see, right before the transplant and uh, is continued through the transplant and post-transplant period, um, sometimes for many months and even years, depending on how uh, GVHD um, is doing in that particular patient. So moving to the next slide, uh, we will briefly talk about the conditioning regimen. And uh, um, the question is, why do I worry about the conditioning regimen since, you know, it's not the area of my expertise? Um, there are a few um, very important points to remember, but first uh, let's go over uh, the goals of the conditioning regimen. 
So the goals of the conditioning regimen is to destroy as much residual cancer as possible, which is done uh, with uh, intensive regimens plus minus total body irradiation. Uh, and the second goal for allergenic transplant patients is to suppress uh, your own immune system to allow the graft or your new stem cell to take in um, in the best possible manner. Uh, because now we have a lot of patients that might not have a, a very good functional status, uh, non-myeloablative or reduced intensity regimens uh, have been studies um, studied and um, they've been shown to be beneficial in terms of they're associated with shorter times of neutropenia, the, there is less mucosal injury. Um, so for infectious disease, even perspective, uh, these regimens are typically associated with uh, potentially less infectious complications. So a few um, examples where it's important for us uh, um, infectious disease uh, doctors to know. Um, remember that busulfan-based uh, uh, regimens, um, when we have a patient on this particular regimen, um, before uh, we start or change an antifungal prophylaxis, specifically it's an azole base, um, this would need to be uh, discussed very closely with the BMT team um, in a BMT pharmacy, again, due to significant drug-drug interactions. If the patient is receiving melphalon-based regimen, uh, we are going to be on a lookout for significant diarrhea as a side effect. Um, and uh, the question is always, um, you know, whether we... we uh, test them repeatedly for C. diff, or we do GI panel, or we do stool cultures. Um, uh, yes, and a lot of times it's appropriate. However, um, again, if I, uh, I'm i taking care of the patient who is receiving a melphalan, I'm expected to um, see a lot of diarrhea on a daily basis for uh, many days to come. In the patients that are receiving cyclophosphamide-based regimens, we will be on the lookout for uh, complications such as hemorrhagic cystitis uh, that is caused by cyclophosphamide itself. Um, and also, uh, that would be um, another regimen that we would need to discuss with the BMT team or the pharmacy uh, regarding azole therapy if we're planning to use it for the prophylaxis. And here is just a nice table um, that was published in the Frontiers in Pediatrics that uh, just shows you how all of these drugs um, um, that we're given for uh, conditioning, uh, prophylaxis, and immunosuppression, here you see tacrolimus, you see how they all interfere with each other. So this is why we work very closely with our BMT colleagues, um, our pharmacists and BMT pharmacists to uh, make sure that um, we check, um, cross-check drug-drug interactions very closely. So once the patient received the conditioning regimen, um, and the transplant is given, as I already told you, we will be in this very critical zone uh, where patient is going to become profoundly neutropenic and uh, will be at a very high risk for infectious complications. And uh, here is a nice table uh, that outlines the timeline of infections commonly seen after stem cell transplant. So as you can see here in the early uh, post-transplant period, uh, which um, occurs from day zero to day, you know, roughly uh, 30, uh, most, of, most of the patients, um, most of the times are at high risk for your bacterial pathogens, such as gram-negative bacilli, gram-positive organisms, and the GI strep pathogens. 
So most of the times, this would be the infections that are either coming from um, your own body, meaning there is a translocation occurs, uh, or we also see quite a bit of infections that are coming from uh, the central line or catheter associated infections. Um, also, this would be the time where if patient does not receive prophylaxis, most of the patients will reactivate HSV virus. So within the first couple of weeks after the transplant. Um, and in terms of the fungal infections, this would be the time where uh, candida infections are very common. And then at the end, uh, you also see the rise of aspergillus uh, um, infections as well. Uh, one more uh, very interesting phenomena that I wanted to uh, bring up. Um, so in the patients specifically undergoing hypoidentical uh, graft infusion, non-infectious fevers are extremely, extremely common and uh, uh, would occur in about nine out of 10 uh, patients uh, post haploidentical transplant between day zero and plus six. So the etiology of this fevers uh, um, is that um, haploidentical transplant itself uh, causes a cytokine release syndrome due to class two mismatch. So this patient patients uh, typically experience very high fevers, um, you know, 39, 40 degrees uh, for a few days, and uh, they typically continue to be febrile until they complete a second dose of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, uh, which is given on day plus three and plus four. So typically, these fevers resolve uh, on day plus five. Uh, because uh, very often it, it's difficult to determine if uh, these fevers are in fact are isolated CRS or potentially could be related to sepsis. Um, most of the, these patients do receive uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, and um, if a CRS uh, becomes of a high grade, um, we're talking about grade three, grade four, some of those patients might need to receive tocilizumab or steroids if tocilizumab is not available. So, and let's talk about engraftment briefly. So, engraftment is defined uh, as a uh, persistent absolute neutrophil count more than 500. So, when uh, our patient um, started starting to recover counts and achieve ENC of 500 after a period of neutropenia, that's when we say that the patient is engrafted. Um, engraftment occurs uh, much quicker in the patients undergoing autologous bone marrow transplant. Engraftment typically occurs on day seven or eight in those patients. Uh, contrary to allergenic stem cell transplant, when uh, your typical duration of neutropenia is about 14 days. However, it could be up to 21 days in the patients that receive haploidentical or mismatched transplant, and uh, it could be even longer, up to four weeks, uh, especially if patient received um, a bone marrow graft source or um, a recipient of, of a cord blood um, transplant. And uh, engraftment is used um, as a one of the criteria to be discharged uh, for our inpatients. From an uh, ID perspective, uh, engraftment typically is a time when antibi antibiotics and antifungal prophylaxis can be discontinued if you are not treating any acute infection at that point. And uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, graft versus host disease and uh, why uh, we as infectious disease doctors need to be aware of it. Um, so acute and chronic graft versus host disease results from allo-reactive donor T-cell mediated tissue damage that occurs after the transplant or uh, during the transplant. 
It can affect any of the organs, but gastrointestinal and skin um, systems are the most commonly affected types. Uh, why we need to be on a lookout for GBHD uh, is because uh, we know that uh, acute and chronic GBHD is associated with a, a high incidence of infections, uh, especially in those patients that are requiring high doses of immunosuppressants um, and or steroids. Uh, patients that experience chronic GVHD must be carefully monitored uh, for um, skin-related complications such as cellulitis, skin tears, skin ulcers. Um, that's one thing. Uh, we need to monitor their catheter entry sites very carefully because a lot of times uh, the skin around uh, catheter entry sites uh, is affected by GVHD. Um, oral mucosa uh, has to be carefully monitored as well uh, because GVHD can affect um, um, your oral mucosa as well, putting those patients at higher risk for um, gram positive um, and gram negative rod translocations. And uh, uh, these patients uh, require uh, regular viral surveillance to prevent and treat latent infection reactivations such as HHV6, EBV, um, and CMV specifically. Um, this is a very um, a new but very important uh, point to mention. Um, there has been a couple of papers uh, recently pub published on this, uh, stating that the exposure to anaerobic antibiotics uh, is associated with increased risk of acute gut um, and or liver GBHD. Um, and uh, actually, there was an um, increased mortality um, in patients with acute GBHD, specifically um, if um, anaerobic antibiotics were uh, used in those patients. Uh, so keeping this in mind, um, um, always be uh, very cautious and uh, careful about using um, antibiotics such as Zolcin or carb carbapenems uh, in patients um, um, in gen generally on a BMT unit uh, because of this uh, new data coming out. Uh, of course, there are multiple situations uh, when we do uh, need to use broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, however, the general rule is that um, if the infection is treated or uh, we believe um, um, broad spectrum antibiotics such as Zosin or carbapenem can be de-escalated, this should be done as soon as possible to um, decrease the incidence um, uh, of these complications that I just uh, discussed. And here are just uh, some pictures of uh, skin GVHD. Uh, over here, you see kind of our uh, typical appearance of acute GVHD rash in the middle. Um, you see this picture of a patient with a scleroderma-like uh, uh, skin GVHD. And on your very right, you see the picture of a patient with um, a lichenoid-like skin GVHD. So it can have uh, different appearances. GVHD can affect any other organs, as I already mentioned, the GI tract, um, here is um, uh, the appearance of uh, the CT chest in the patients with GVHD. Uh, it can also affect your liver, um, brain, essentially any organs. Um, um, any organs can be affected, uh, and um, patients need to be closely monitored for that. So in order to prevent GVHD, um, immunosuppressant agents are used that are generally started um, right before the transplant. And as I already mentioned, they're 
typically continued for um, a period over four to six months with the goal to discontinue eventually. Uh, however, um, many patients do experience uh, some degree of GVHD and therefore remain on immunosuppressants for months and sometimes even years. So remember that the GVHD becomes uh, mostly an issue in um, uh, allergenic um, transplant patients and not an autologous transplant patient. Um, even autologous transplant patients can experience uh, uh, very mild graft versus host disease from their own stem infusion. Um, but again, it's extremely rare and uh, typically uh, those symptoms do not require any specific treatments with immunosuppression. Calcineurin inhibitor-based therapies are, are uh, most commonly used uh, to treat GVHD uh, with um, uh, two main immunosuppressants being tacrolimus cyclosporin, um, MMF, as well as serolimus. So here is a, a graph that comes from uh, um, another New England Journal of Medicine article, which was published in 2004, that actually goes over immunosuppressant agents that are used um, um, in renal transplant patients. Uh, but again, it has excellent uh, graphs. And uh, I just included it here so you can see uh, where these medications work. So here is your tacrolimus and uh, cyclosporin. Uh, there are your calcineurin inhibitors. And here is your uh, serolimus, which would, would be working towards the mTOR pathway. Here is a, the graph, again, from the same paper that uh, goes over the mechanism of actions of these two um, most commonly used immunosuppressants. And uh, I wanted you to pay attention uh, to uh, these two very common complications that, as an ID doctor, um, I need to be worried about. Uh, specifically for the serolimus, uh, this medication is known to be associated with a delayed wound healing. Uh, therefore, if uh, uh, we have a bone marrow transplant patient um, who either needs an extensive surgery or has a wound and is on the serolimus, um, we would work very closely with the BMT physician to see if um, uh, potentially we can either taper it or even switch immunosuppression to allow uh, uh, wound healing. Uh, for the tacrolimus, um, um, again, wound healing can be an issue as well, but not um, in uh, as bad degree as a serolimus. And another side effect for the tacrolimus to be aware of uh, would be a neurotoxicity, um, as it has an excellent um, um, blood-brain uh, barrier penetration uh, quality. And um, moving next. Um, so a lot of times uh, these days, uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide uh, is used uh, for GVHD prophylaxis, specifically in the patients that are receiving mismatched unrelated donor um, haploidentical donor and uh, even a mud un unrelated uh, transplant. As um, the studies show that it lowers the incidence of acute and chronic GVHD after allergenic stem cell transplant. So for the short, we call it PTCY. Uh, typically is administered on day plus three, plus four after the transplant. And uh, for us um, uh, to be aware of is that um, there is um, uh, more and more literature coming out that PTCY is associated with increased risk of CMV infection in seropositive haploidentical um, and uh, sibling uh, stem cell recipients um, 
with conventional GBHD prophylaxis. Uh, so just remember that it uh, increases your risk of CMV infections in seropositive uh, um, recipients. And this is where you can find this data. And again, this is just um, the same table that I already showed to you before. And uh, uh, for the remainder, a reminder of the lecture, I would like to uh, briefly go over the principles of prophylaxis um, that we use uh, for our bone marrow transplant patient. So as I already mentioned, uh, um, reactivation of um, HSV is very, very common in HSV seropositive patients if prophylaxis is not used. Uh, this is why we're very aggressive uh, with our antiviral prophylaxis that usually starts on admission to BMT unit, or if the patient is receiving a transplant in the uh, outpatient sector, it usually is started uh, when chemotherapy is initiated. It is continued post-discharge post engraftment due to slow immune reconstitution and ongoing risk of reactivation. So this would be um, a prophylaxis that we do not just simply discontinue when ANC is above 500 or when the patient is discharged. So this is something that would will continue beyond discharge. Um, here are your antiviral options with uh, acyclovir uh, being uh, most commonly used. And then um, if we have a patient with a breakthrough infection on acyclovir or patient uh, um, with a, a prior history of multiple breakthroughs, then we would go either to valacyclovir or famcyclovir. And actually at Moffitt, we would use valacyclovir. For the antibacterial prophylaxis, um, the most important uh, goal is to target gram-negative organisms and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It is recommended for high-risk patients that um, our patients um, um, would meet criteria for. Um, it is typically initiated at the beginning of the risk period. And in most of the places, this is all protocol-driven. So at Moffitt, uh, we initiate your uh, antibacterial prophylaxis when ANC count goes below 1,000 for allergenic transplant patients. And uh, for the autologous transplant patients, um, if they are um, receiving transplant as an outpatient, uh, this would start at day zero. Again, this is all protocol driven. The prophylaxis will continue throughout the period of neutropenia and uh, will be discontinued once ANC reaches above 500 or the patient engrafts. So we use uh, fluoroquinolone-based regimens, uh, which is consistent with uh, the guidelines um, uh, for uh, neutropenia prophylaxis. Um, ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin would be our um, main agents used. And remember that levofloxacin would be preferred in patients with mucositis and increased risk for streptococcus viridis infection from translocation. So those might be the patients uh, with mucositis, poor dentition, recent dental extractions where their mucosas are not healing well, or uh, also uh, we might prefer then the patients with um, some minor uh, skin issues, um, open wounds uh, to give us that extra gram positive coverage. The antifungal prophylaxis um, uh, targets uh, mostly candida species or the combination of candida uh, and uh, molds. So typically, again, it's initiated at the beginning of the risk period. Uh, and um, typically, it uh, coincides uh, with antibacterial prophylaxis. For uh, patients undergoing allergenic stem cell transplant, 
Um, this would be initiated once you are ANC less than 1000. And again, for the patients that are undergoing autologous transplant in the outpatient sector, we would start on day zero. Um, we can discontinue antifungal prophylaxis once patient in grafts or ANC becomes more than 500. However, as you can see here, I put a warning up here. Um, as there is a significant drug-drug interactions that occur between um, uh, the azoles and immunosuppression. Therefore, before um, we discontinue an azole-based um, prophylaxis in allergenic transplant patients, we absolutely have to check with the BMT team and their pharmacists to make sure that um, it's, it's okay to stop it, uh, or um, we need to adjust their immunosuppression before uh, azole therapy is stopped. And uh, here I just created a little table uh, that shows you uh, the options uh, that we can use for antifungal prophylaxis in the patients um, that are undergoing autotransplant versus an allo. As you can see here for our autologous transplant patient, our default drug is fluconazole. And then if there is a, a contraindication, such as a patient has a prolonged QTC interval, uh, elevated OLFTs, then we would go to uh, mycofungin. Um, on the allergenic transplant side, our uh, default drug is actually mycofungin. The reasoning is behind it is, um, again, there are significant drug-drug interactions that typically occur at the time of initiation of antifungals, um, as those patients typically receive chemotherapy at that time. So mycofungin is just a kind of a cleaner uh, drug to use that um, allows you not to worry about uh, certain drug-drug interactions. And then um, if we have uh, uh, some concerns for mold infections, we uh, go ahead and use um, mold active um, azole therapy such as voriconazole, posaconazole, or isovuconazole. And uh, again, any changes uh, in azole-based regimen requires uh, uh, direct communication with the BMT team uh, to assure that um, um, our immunosuppression levels remain in steady state. Uh, we very rarely use this type of drugs um, um, in autologous transplant patients, uh, typically because uh, the duration of neutropenia is very short. Um, uh, therefore, um, it becomes uh, uh, less of an issue. PCP prophylaxis uh, is typically initiated uh, for our allergenic um, BMT patients at day 28 uh, to 30, so at the end of the first month, and uh, is continued as long as they remain on immunosuppression. Um, so this is a little in contrary with um, our HIV patients when uh, we can use a, a CD4 count to uh, guide uh, our prophylaxis. Um, so what happens with these patients, as long as they remain on immunosuppression, um, even though their lymphocyte count might look normal, um, the lymphocyte function um, might continue to be impaired for a very long time. Uh, and uh, occasionally breakthrough PCP infections can occur in patients that remain on immunosuppression, but do not receive uh, PCP prophylaxis. Um, in the patients undergoing autologous B, uh, BMT, um, in general, they do not require PCP prophylaxis uh, unless PCP prophylaxis is indicated based on their disease um, or there are other risk factors that would put him at higher risk for PCP. So those risk factors would be um, use of high dose of steroids, recipients of lymphodepleting chemotherapy regimens such as fludarabine, recipients of um, alimtuzumab, 
um, and so forth. And in general, if uh, PCP prophylaxis is started on um, autologous BMT patients, it's continued only for a short time because their immune reconstitution occurs much quicker comparing to our allergenic transplant patients because there is no immunosuppression after the transplant. And here is just a slide on the toxoplasma prophylaxis um, that again is indicated in the patient's uh, post-allergenic stem cell transplant that are toxo uh, serology positive on a pre-transplant screening. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a new kit on the block um, in the past. Uh, for the CMV prophylaxis, um, um, what we used to have um, is a, a weekly CMV PCR checks uh, starting uh, the week following the transplant. And then um, uh, we would initiate uh, preemptive therapy once a CMV PCR becomes positive. So now in the patients that are considered high risk, um, we use um, uh, this new agent, which is called Litermavir, uh, which um, uh, has shown to be beneficial in preventing uh, CMV infections in this high risk patients post allergenic transplant. So in a CMV positive recipients, um, with uh, the addition of other risk factors, such as recipient of mismatched or haploidentical transplant, recipient of cord blood transplant, recipient of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, or recipient of ATG or alemtuzumab, we will go ahead and uh, initiate litermavir uh, at day plus eight after the transplant. And uh, uh, this will continue until day plus 100 post-transplant. Along with that, there will be an ongoing weekly uh, CM CMV PCR surveillance uh, going on. And uh, if reactivation does occur on Litormavir, then this agent will be discontinued and patient will be started on a CMV treatment protocol. And uh, briefly going back to our uh, two cases. So remember um, patient um, number one uh, was the patient uh, uh, who was admitted to undergo haploidentical transplant for the treatment of MDS and AML. We also found that he had some small pulmonary nodules on the VOT or vital organ testing. We also found out that he had um, positive CMV serologies pre-transplant. This is his conditioning regimen Fludarabin plus busulfan. So by looking at his regimen, I see that he's uh, um, getting busulfan, which tells me that if I want to introduce an azole therapy to treat his pulmonary nodules, I might need to wait until he completes his chemotherapy and uh, there is no significant drug-drug interactions. Uh, here is his GVHD prophylaxis. Um, so based on this, I see that he's going to receive post-transplant cyclophosphamide, tacrolimus, and uh, MMF. Um, how it matters to me is that uh, typically, um, again, the antifungal agent would be delayed until after patient completes post-transplant cyclophosphamide, again, to allow drug-drug interactions to clear. Uh, and uh, this is the case number two. Remember the patient with multiple myeloma who was getting admitted to undergo autologous stem cell transplant. His conditioning regimen um, consists of melphalan, which remember tells me that most likely this patient will have significant amount of diarrhea. We also found out that this patient was CMV serology positive pre-transplant. And because he, he is receiving autologous transplant, he is going to receive no GVHD prophylaxis. So based on this information, for our patient on the left, patient number one, 
our prophylaxis will look like this. Uh, we will start a cycle of year when he gets admitted. Once his ANC becomes less than 1,000, we will give him ciprofloxacin for antimicrobial prophylaxis. We will initiate mycofungin when ANC becomes less than 1,000. However, um, on day plus five, when drug-drug interactions allow, and this is typically the time when uh, we are able to uh, use any type of azole therapy that we would like to use. So when drug-drug interactions allow, because uh, of the pulmonary nodules, we're going to go ahead and change him or transition him to voriconazole um, at that point, and we will continue it throughout the period of a transplant. Because the patient is CMV positive uh, and the recipient of mismatched or haploidentical transplant and the recipient of a post-transplant cyclophosphamide, he would be considered high risk for CMV reactivation. This is why he will be started on lutermavir um, on day plus eight. And once he gets discharged on day uh, plus 28, we will initiate PCP prophylaxis per protocol. Now going back to uh, patient number two. Again, for him, we will initiate a cyclovir on admission. When he's ANC less than 1,000, we will start him on ciprofloxacin and the fluconazole for antifungal prophylaxis. And uh, both of these agents can be discontinued when he engrafts. Because he is a, a patient undergoing autologous stem cell transplant, he is not considered a high risk for CMV reactivation or invasive disease, um, even despite the fact that his CMV serologies are positive. So there, there will be no need for CMV prophylaxis uh, immediately. Um, and uh, again, because uh, there is no immunosuppression involved after he completes his autologous transplant, um, at this point there will be no indications to prescribe him PCP prophylaxis unless in the future he receives certain chemotherapies or high dose of steroids or, you know, any other changes that would warrant reinitiation of that. And uh, I will stop at this point and we'll take questions. Thank you, Thank Olga, you all for a great, great presentation. presentation. Um, uh, I, I would just, just uh, make a comment uh, that yes. Moffitt for 10 years had cord blood transplant. And my observation in that population was they were the most immune suppressed and most likely to reactivate every dormant bug and virus in their body, including HHV6, adenovirus, uh, they would get incredible uh, types of reactivation, was amazing. I think, I don't know how well they did the selection process, but because of the mortality being quite high, um, they quit doing it. So, cord blood transplant is a ID doctor's nightmare or bonus depending on how you look at it because it's extremely complicated right. and you have to be very astute with them and then the closest we come to that in your population would be what the mismatched aloe or the car t patient what do you think uh i think it's a mismatched unrelated donor um, with a uh, chronic GVHD on uh, heavy immunosuppression that a lot of times includes two agents plus uh, Jacophy plus steroids. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Any other questions? Uh, other questions I from the uh, Dr. Glinkova, this is an amazing presentation. I love that you pretty much just went through the bread and butter of uh, a BMT rotation. So uh, if Dr. Ayler actually uploads this presentation, I recommend every first year fellow to go through this uh, because you'll know the acronyms. You won't be lost. This is a great presentation. Thank you so much. It was great. A great review.
Yes, Dr. Klinkova, thank you for taking such a complicated topic and making it so straightforward. Uh, and I will post this on idpodcast.net in the near future um, because uh, it's always good to go through these protocols and, uh, you know, and, and commit them more to memory. So thank you again. Other questions from the group? So uh, last minute, no, go ahead. I'll uh, defer to the person talking. Hey, Dr. Green. Uh, this is Guy. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, the same thing. I don't have, feel like I have anything else to teach David for the rotation, but um, a couple things on uh, what you mentioned with the autologous transplants. There's actually a good study with the pre and post intervention that was in TID this year where they looked at only starting um, prophylaxis once the neutrophils were less than 500. And the arm that actually did that had less neutropenic fever. So I think, you know, it's harder logistically to do it because a lot of these patients are outpatient, but it does save antibiotic days and potentially reduces yes. fevers. And then um, another thing we see sometimes with serolimus because we get called with fevers and any sort of abnormality, uh, it can cause pneumonitis and ILD, which you had mentioned, um, but it's something that, you know, we do get called a lot for. And uh, I do think the microbiome stuff is fascinating and going to become only more and more of a issue with these patients and even beyond kind of we know giving anaerobic coverage might uh you know make gbhd worse they actually have some early work that if you can potentially restore part of the microbiome it might attenuate gbhd um but it, that, that's a fascinating area of research i think for the future yes that's a great point yes thank you um I'll, I'll, I'll address my question comment, which is uh, you guys did a great study where you found that it was safe to de-escalate people from IV antibiotics after a neutropenic fever uh, and uh, by going back to an oral regimen when nothing, um, when nothing grows and there's no obvious infection to treat. So this helps obviously antibiotic stewardship with rapid de-escalation. And now because of your pilot study, it's the new norm there. I will caution though, you could probably do the same thing in a leukemia population, very similar, which is being addressed, but they are a little bit different than bone marrow patients. At least most of mine tend to be neutropenic a longer period of time, making it a little complicated, but uh, IDSA and NCCN are trying to move towards giving us evidence-based guidelines on de-escalating febrile neutropenics because in the old days they would stay on antibiotics for weeks and weeks IV mm -hmm. and when is it safe to de-escalate them and then re-escalate them again and then you found no uh, bad outcomes when doing that uh, but from an old timer who's used to the old system it's hard to change right away what is your experience with de-escalation is it uh, very safe to do in this protocol in bone marrow patients? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Green. It's a great question. So um, in general, um, I would say in the patient who uh, be became a febrile uh, and uh, we have no positive cultures or no positive imaging, we have been de-escalating at day five or seven. And as far as I can tell, based on my uh, limited experience, I have not seen uh, bad outcomes from that. Uh, in the patients that um, have uh, uh, potentially fevers from PTCY or uh, haploidentical transplant fevers, as um, I showed you, uh, we sometimes de-escalate as uh, early as two to three days uh, once they are febrile. 